All right, then, and I guess we're at time, so we'll go ahead and start. All right. Welcome. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, usability uh, testing and open source software. And to get started, think about how easy are your programs to use? And not just how easy is it for you, the person who wrote it, but how easy is your program to use for somebody who has never seen it before? Because that's really what usability testing is about. So my presentation is under the uh, Creative Commons, and it's, I'll make sure there's a uh, link out there uh, when we're done. So to get started, uh, what is usability? There's, there seems to be some confusion around what is usability. Um, but I find it helps to have just a, a, a short definition and sort of carry around. And the definition that I like to use is that usability means that real people can do real tasks in a realistic amount of time. Uh, and it's not the same as user experience or UX. Uh, people will often... Uh, confuse user experience and user and, and usability. Uh, people will talk about you know uh, improving the the user experience. Well, that's not necessarily the same as uh, usability. User uh, usability um, uh, are often the um, it, you often have programs that have good usability and a good user experience. And if a program has bad usability, it'll very likely have a bad user experience. But it is possible to have a program with good usability have a bad user experience, and a program with bad usability have a good user experience. And the example I like to give, and I've taught this, this topic, by the way, on, on usability. I've, I, I've taught this as a, as a topic in, in uh, university level, uh, but I've also worked with uh, GNOME for the last uh, three or four years. The example I like to use about a program that has bad usability but a good user experience uh, is um, the game Hedgehogs. Ever played that on Linux? It's, um, it's basically little, hedge, little cartoon hedgehogs that use weapons and they'll just shoot it. You just, hmm? It's very similar to worms. Very similar to worms. So you get little hedgehogs and they move around the screen and they shoot each other with weapons. Uh, every time I play that game, I cannot remember how to use it. I cannot figure out how to move around. I cannot figure out how to change weapons. I'm hitting every key on the keyboard uh, just in experimenting, trying to figure out what to do, because there's nothing that tells you how to do it. Um, I have a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> and when I'm done, I wind up going, that was a lot of fun. It was frustrating at the beginning, but I had a lot of fun at the end. I had good user experience, very bad usability. Uh, so that's, that's why usability and user experience are not always the same thing. So there are different ways to test usability. I'm going to be talking about usability really today. Different ways to test usability. You can do um, direct testing or you can do indirect testing. And so direct testing, uh, things like uh, a formal usability test, which is the most common and is actually easiest to explain, so I'm actually going to talk about it today. Uh, even though it sounds like it's a lot of formal usability tests, it's actually pretty easy to do. Uh, you can do a paper prototype test, and I have an example of that as well. Uh, you can do what's called an animated prototype test, which is the same thing as a paper prototype test. The difference is this. Uh, with a paper prototype test, uh, you have printouts of what your new design might look like. You want to make a change to the design. You want to make it easier to look like, or easier to, easier to use. And so you'll print out the screens. And uh, because you don't have a functioning program yet, probably. Uh, and so you'll print out some screens of what it might look like. And then you ask people to use it as though it were a real product. Point to things, right? Just point to things. That's a paper prototype test. Tell me where you would click to do this or that. That's a paper prototype test. An animated paper prototype test is actually where you, you might actually um, have like, okay, so you've clicked on this, so you're gonna get a drop-down menu. So here's an extra sheet of paper that actually has a drop-down menu on it. It's very similar to a paper prototype test, but it's slightly different. Um, and you actually get a lot of useful results out of, out of both types of tests. 
And then you can also do a user experience test, which I said is not the same thing as usability, but it is part of the experience, part of the overall thing. So it, it is helpful to do. Uh, for indirect, you can do what's called a heuristic evaluation. That really means you have a usability expert come in and give, a t uh, give an evaluation of, of how, how useful or how, how usable your program might be. Uh, you could do questionnaires. That's, you see that websites doing that a lot. Uh, you could do interviews or focus groups, and that gets used in a variety of different scenarios. You could have websites that as well. Uh, or again, you can do a user, user experience test. The important thing is user experience tests are both direct and indirect. It's, they're kind of fuzzy, uh, and, and it's really hard to do. I, I can talk about that at the end if we have more time, but uh, user experience tests are uh, a bit different, and so I, I've reserved that at the end if, if there's time. So how do you do a usability test? Um, really need to answer a couple of questions to get started. And that is you need to understand who are your users. And those are called uh, personas, the, 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 the word fat are personas. Uh, and what you need to do really is just document your personas. Just document who are the people who use the software. It doesn't have to be in depth. You don't have to go into a lot of work, you don't have to do a lot of research, but you kind of know who your users are. And just describe at a general level who are your users. And if you can, if you can make that sort of a fictional user that sort of describes a group of people, that actually is best, especially if you can like put a name to that. And the reason you do that is so that way when you make design decisions, you're not making a decision by saying, well, this is going to be a cool feature, so I'd like to add it, right? That happens to a lot of programs, and it causes feature bloat, and then it becomes confusing because somebody added a feature that was cool to a developer, and they didn't think about how users are using it. But if you have personas, you can say, how does this feature benefit Steve? How does this, benef how does this feature benefit Andrea? How does this benefit one of my personas. And so once you have that, then, then describe why are they using your system. And again, you don't have to be very in-depth. You can describe this in just a couple of sentences. You know, you could, if you've got a, uh, if you're the, the developer behind LibreOffice, right, your, pro your, your scenarios are probably something simple like, you know, they're sitting down to write a paper for class or they're, uh, creating uh, slides for a presentation at uh, open source and Linux tag, uh, or they could be doing uh, a spreadsheet to manage uh, finances. I mean, just it's just a couple of sentences that describes why they're using it. By going through that process, it actually really helps you to focus um, on the usability. And that allows you to do the third thing, which is uh, to understand why, or actually be able to answer why are, what are they doing on the system? So it's not a why, but it's a what. What are they doing on the system? And that winds up being uh, your usability test because saying what are they doing on the system are these little scenario tasks. And by having several scenario tasks together, you have a usability test. So there's a little bit of work up front to do document who are the users and why are they using the system. But once you have that, a usability test becomes really easy to do. And so a usability test is really going to be iterative. You're going to do, you know, once you define all that stuff up front, then it winds up being, you just do a test. If you analyze your results and then you tweak your design based on those results and then you do it again. And that might sound like a lot of work. Doing a usability, usability test might sound like a lot of work, but it actually isn't. Uh, and if you do, I'll tell that actually on the next slide, but in, 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 it's not a lot of work. And if you do this iteratively, um, most projects that do it iteratively can uh, figure out most of the problems on their design and get, get a system that's going to work well for everybody in usually like two or three iterations. So it doesn't require very many tests. But how many testers do you need to get good results? You might think, well, I'm going to need to get 10, 20, 30 people together to do some usability tests, right? I, 
whenever I talk about usability testing and when I, when I, when I teach it, uh, you know, the first the people seem to assume that it takes a lot of testers to get good usability test results. I need like 10 or 20 people. No, you don't. It turns out you only need five. You only need five testers to get results that are good enough to improve your usability test. And so this is a chart that uh, came from um, uh, uh, Jacob Nielsen, who's a, uh, a well-known usability uh, tester. And he uh, came up with this, this graph that, that shows how many usability problems on the left can you find in your design with how many testers? And he finds that the, the, the curve is really described by what's on the upper right there, which is 1 minus 1 minus L to the N. But the important thing is uh, looking at what you're seeing up there. It, the, um, once you've got five testers, the curve has now just gone beyond 80%. So doing five testers is going to uncover about 80% of your usability problems. And so once you start adding more testers beyond five, you're not uncovering significantly more test, more problems. You know, once you go to six, you're at uh, just short of 90%. So the, res the, the benefits of adding more people beyond five is not as great as getting up to five. Five winds up being a good magic number. Because another way to imagine that is this. Uh, this pink square, this red square, uh, covers about, on the left-hand side, covers about 31% of the gray square. And uh, 30, uh, an average tester can uncover about 31% of usability problems in any program, in a single usability test. And so the, the, the middle one here shows, uh, uh, it's randomly, uh, I, I generated this image by randomly uh, putting more squares on top of this uh, gray square. And you can see that as you do this, that you, know, add, you add a second tester, you're, un you're uncovering uh, new issues, but you're also finding some of the same issues. And you add a third tester, and they're going to hit the, some of the same problems, but they might find something new. And then all the way up to five, and you can see that uh, by the time you get to five, you've uncovered a lot of the gray square. You've, you've covered up a lot of the, gray, of, of the gray square. You've uncovered a lot of usability issues. And you'll note that it's not significantly different from 10. I mean, 10 certainly has covered more, but it's not a lot more. So five is really what you need to have to have a good usability test. Uh, picking the people who are going to help you in your test is also important because who are your users, right? Back to the question of who were your users. If you're doing a usability test um, on GNOME Builder, uh, which is a development environment, uh, you probably don't want people who only do graphics design to be testing that because they don't do coding. They don't do that level of coding. GNOME Builder will be confusing to them. Just like if you're going to do a usability test on GIMP, graphics program, you probably don't want people who've never done graphics design. So you need to have testers that sort of match uh, your, uh, your program, the people who are actually going to use your program. They don't have to be an exact match, but they need to be close. Um, when you have something like GNOME, which is really intended for everyone, that becomes more challenging. And so in my usability testing background, I've been uh, working with GNOME since 2014, uh, doing usability testing. And GNOME is uh, intended for everyone. Everyone is supposed to be able to use GNOME. So how do you pick testers for that? Uh, you wind up, one way that I recommend people to do it is sort of say, well, there are, there are several ways to pick it out. But the way I chose to uh, do that is uh, sort of look at experience and age, right? It's supposed to be for people of all experience levels and people of all ages. And so just break it down, right? You can have people who have very little experience, who have sort of average experience, and they have a lot of experience. And age could be 
oh, let's say um, up until about up until the teens, and then the middle one could be teens through your twenties or thirties, and the the one on the very right could be uh, people thirty and over, right? And just break it up in some way, and then just make sure you've got people from each one of those uh, areas. So in this case, you'd have to pick probably nine people to try and represent it, but I've just picked it there. Five is still good, but just make sure you're not picking all five people from like one square. <laughs> you know, people who are in their teens who have moderate amount of experience. That will tell you some stuff, but that won't tell you a lot. So make sure you're kind of spreading it out. So let me actually show you some usability test results. Because how do you understand the results is really... Uh, what's going to help you uh, uh, with the usability test results under, and actually improve your program. So the results I'm going to show you today have come from actual usability tests uh, with GNOME. So the first one uh, came from my master's program back in 2014 when I got my master's degree. And I actually did two usability tests for this. Uh, one of them was uh, involved uh, the gedit editor, Firefox web browser, and the Nautilus file manager. Nautilus and gedit are both part of GNOME. So I had scenarios that were uh, described a, uh, set up a brief context, and then asked the tester to do something specific. That's too much text for me to put up in a table, so I've just summarized it. Uh, something like, uh, uh, Increasing the font size, which you can see is the third one in Firefox. Uh, the the, the scenario, scenario task for that was probably something like uh, you don't have your glasses with you and the text on this website uh, is too difficult to read. Uh, make the text on the web page bigger. It sets up a brief context for that task. You've forgotten your glasses and you can't read the text, and then asks the tester to do something specific. Make the, test, make the text on the website bigger. Because that allows you, uh, the, the person now understands why they're doing it, and they now have uh, enough understanding that they, can, they should understand when they've done that task. And you can understand when they've done that task, and you should both agree when the task is done. And so the trick that I've developed is, um, this is called a heat map. And uh, the heat map is, is done this way. Uh, you can see that every task in each one of my usability tests is a, is a row. And then for my usability tests, every column is a different tester. So you can see for this one, because I was working on a master's degree and five wasn't enough, I had what I have here. I have one, two, three, it looks like I had seven people in this test. And by the way, you can see that five would have been enough to uncover the same problems. You're, you're getting a lot of similarity across all five users. So every cell then is that user doing that scenario task. And then you color it green if that tester had no problems at all doing that task. They just sailed right through. And then you do it uh, yellow if that person had some problems doing it. Maybe you had to click around a little bit, but they got there. It was pretty easy. Just had to go and find it a little bit. Orange if it required some clicking around and maybe looking into some of the menus, but they got to it. Red for it, it was the hardest thing ever. They got it done, but oh my gosh, I was looking all over. They might have even had to go into the menus twice to try and look at look for stuff because they just could not understand where the menu was or what the action was called or what the button was labeled. I mean, they really ha had to work for uh, finding it. And then black, which is not up here, if that person, if that task was so hard that the user couldn't even do it, they gave up. I can't do this. So I colored it in black. So if you have a heat map, all you now have to look for are what I would call a hot row. Black, red, orange. The more black, red, and orange that you have on a row, the harder that task was to do. And so for this test, 
uh, under gedit, no problems until you got to changing the default font and changing the default colors, which are, by, by the way, both in the same menu. And so it was very interesting that people were able to do the font but not the colors. I mean, they had, they had trouble with both, I should say. It wasn't easier to do the second one. Um, and then uh, yeah, there's, I, I would ignore the, the couple of red blocks here under setting a website as a default page and saving an image from a website. Uh, and I would say the next big problem is, is under Nautilus, creating a bookmark to a folder. And that task was very straightforward. It was like, uh, you're gonna, uh, I, I'd given them a, several scenarios that involved them with doing a project that involved a lot of files. And I said, you're gonna be coming back to this folder a lot over the course of your project. Um, do something that makes it easier for you to come back to that folder in a single click later on. And if you've used Nautilus before, you recognize that as a bookmark, but I'm not using the term bookmark because that's the name of the menu item. So a lot of problems doing that. Uh, if I were the developer for GNOME or Nautilus, I probably would focus more on that one and not so much that bottom one about searching for a file. It's some red, one orange, but a lot of green. So I think if I were gonna put, where would I focus my effort? It's gonna be those two on gedit and the one under Nautilus. And then I did the same test again about a year later. And I actually added some things. I took out Firefox and I added some other things. You can still see I did, I did gedit and I did Nautilus. And um, I also added web instead of Firefox and we did the software application and notes. Although uh, this is also where it, it shows a good example of um, be aware of time. Uh, I gave my testers about an hour because I scheduled everybody about an hour apart. And uh, if it's got a white circle in this case, that means that we ran out of time and we, had to, we just stopped. So we got down to about Nautilus renaming a folder and that's when things started to fall apart. But you can also see that one was really hard. So this one's very interesting because you have a lot of colors on it. You've got some green, you've got yellow, you've got red, you've got black. Um, and so where are the hot rows on this one? Uh, the hottest row is under Nautilus, renaming a folder. That was really hard under Nautilus 3.10. That was a really tough task. And it really was a simple uh, scenario task. Like, uh, you know, they, I, I gave them a set of files to start with. And I, it was just simply like, uh, change the name of this folder from this to this. So it wasn't some difficult to understand task. It was a very easy task. And yet two people couldn't even do it. Black. All the others were red, except for one who didn't actually get there. Uh, also a hot row under changing the default font under GEDIT. That, that task was still not getting any easier. <laughs> Uh, now, another thing you can see on this, on this particular uh, heat map is, uh, again, you probably could have done this task with just five. It looks like I did this task, or th this test with two, four, six, eight, ten. It looks like 12 testers. But if you picked any five columns at random, you're probably getting the same results, right? You're still going to be pulling out that change the default font and create and renaming a folder. And I'm not worried too much about the other ones. Maybe there's something up there about replacing all instances of several words under gedit, but I think I'd put my focus on changing the default font before I'd work on that. Uh, but also notice you can actually see if they have any testers that are having some problems with the test. And in this one, there's two testers that seem to have some problems. Uh, the second tester in had some, pro had some problems. Um, and in fact, uh, when that person couldn't even rename the folder on Nautilus, we just skipped ahead for time and said, let's just go and do software and we'll just see if we can do that, uh, do that uh, test. And that person couldn't even install a program, and so we just stopped. Um, and the other one was the second to the last person had some problems, um, having some real trouble. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the third one in, because you can see that that person had a couple of black at the top. Uh, but generally, the testers were pretty good. I'm not seeing any weird columns except for those two. Uh, and those two hot rows are easy to spot. Now, after I got my master's degree in uh, usability testing, I actually uh, have done mentor uh, mentoring for the outreachy internship program for GNOME. 
Uh, and we've had uh, five uh, uh, interns come through the program. And uh, Alan and Jakob uh, from the GNOME design team were really, really helpful uh, in doing these uh, usability tests. And in fact, they've used the uh, results from our internships, from our usability tests, to make GNOME better. And in fact, there was a, a release of GNOME just like the other day. I think it was 3.26. And there's a newly redesigned uh, settings app in that one. I don't know if you've seen the announcement, but that's, that there's a newly redesigned settings app. And that was done specifically through the work that Carrie did. Carrie's the fourth uh, uh, intern that we had. And I'll show uh, their, their, their results in just a second. So let's look at Sanskriti's test real quick. So Sanskriti had, uh, she did a usability test on, on gedit, uh, notes, music, and photos. And it looks like I messed up my notes on gedit 6. So I, I don't remember what that task was. That'd be awfully nice, because that's a really hot row, um, if I could remember what that one was, but I don't. Uh, it was probably changing the default color. Because <laughs> <sighs> I think she used the same test I did. We were curious to see if it had gotten any better. Uh, and so here you can see uh, a couple of hot rows. Uh, that gedit 6, which I think was changing the default color. Uh, and creating two notes in, in notes. It really was uh, a simple thing. Like we, we gave the tasks like, uh, you know, you need to set up some reminders to do some things later. So uh, type these notes. Uh, the, these type these reminders into the GNOME Notes app. Uh, each one is a separate note. Uh, kind of tough. I mean, they got it done. They were able to figure it out, but it was kind of tough to do. Uh, I'm also seeing uh, uh, some hot rows down there under photos. Uh, adding two photos to a, uh, a new album. Uh, adding uh, 10 photos to the same album. Setting a photo to your desktop wallpaper. Was challenging. Uh, actually, creating an album itself was challenging, and we saw that in uh, in Gina's test. Gina's uh, coming up next here, and 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 it was really because uh, if you opened up Photos for the first time ever, uh, there was a, a there there was a note in the background. I can't exactly now remember what the wording was, uh, but it it when when I when, when new users read it, it looked like you should be able to like right click on the background or click on the text that was there to actually start an album, but you actually had to go into a menu. And so it just wasn't clear. It, it was, I'm sure it clear to the developer, but it just wasn't clear to a person who hadn't used no, uh, uh, photos before. Uh, so interesting stuff in here. Also, again, changing the default font and notes seems to be a hard, uh, a hard task. And also uh, a little bit of challenge there on deleting a song from a playlist. And so you can see by doing these uh, heat maps, you're very quickly uh, highlighting the, the areas of the program that need work. And when you do these usability tests and people you know, have these problems, after, the, after each tester is done, if you have time, always ask the tester some questions. You know, I saw that you were struggling when trying to change the default font. Uh, what would have made that easier? Or what were you looking for? But the whole time they're doing the test anyway, you should be taking notes. I find it's easier to have one person working on a computer and then I'm, I'm sitting there next to them with my laptop so I can kind of see the screen and I'm just typing up notes as they go. Whatever they say, I'm typing in. Uh, if they're clicking all over the place, I'm typing that up as well. Where are they clicking? Uh, it's also very helpful if you can do a, a screen recording. You can, you know, there's, there's a, a action to do that under GNOME. You can just do a, a screen recording. Uh, of everything on the desktop, and then you can go back later uh, and see where they were clicking. And if you ask them to speak out loud when they're doing their test, so if you know, I, 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 I tell testers, if you need to print, because we weren't printing, so this was safe to say, I say if you're if you're trying to print, just and you're and you're looking for a print button, just say, I'm looking for a print button. And so if you do that screen recording and you go back and watch it later uh, for, to take notes or to kind of uh, check your notes, you can actually see on the, uh, on the screen where their mouse is, where they're looking for that print button at the same time they're saying, I'm looking for a print button. So it'd be like, 
really helpful to say, wow, they're looking for, everybody seems to be looking for a print button like over here. Maybe we should move the print button over there, right? Things like that. Actually, we learned that through software. And uh, I think that was, uh, was that, oh, who had that test? Um, we found, we found, well, my test, I know for sure, uh, had, had an issue with software. We, had, we did it, I think there's, a, there's, a, a user, there's one coming up where uh, uh, software, to install software, um, you could click on the program and you get the description for the program and there'd be a little button for the website, but nobody could install the software. Like almost everybody was having problems installing software in GNOME software. And why were they having trouble? Well, because um, Western languages, we read from left to right, top to bottom. And so the way that that screen worked was there was the name of the program, there was a screenshot, there was some information below it, like, you know, it's GNU GPL, and there's a little button for a website. And the link, the, the button to install it was way in the upper right-hand corner. And so they were reading this, and they were going down here, and by the time they were done reading, they were down in the middle of the page but the install button was way over here. So it was like, let's move the button <laughs> to where they're looking for it. So Gina was another person that was doing our test, doing usability tests, and so she worked on uh, Nautilus, uh, events and characters, calendar, and image viewer. And so, uh, because she was going for publication, obviously she did a lot more than five testers, but uh, you can see that uh, couple of hot rows in here, right? You can see under Nautilus, saving that folder location, making a bookmark, still hard, <laughs> still hard. Um, saving uh, under events, the uh, PDF reader, uh, saving a title location, uh, or adding a note that contains a check mark that was uh, used in the characters app, uh, kind of tough. There was a challenge in saving file modifications, but I wouldn't worry about that one too much. Uh, you might also be tempted to look at the calendar stuff, but that one's not too bad. I think if, if I were going to look at where I would put my priority, uh, and we did, it was, it was save folder location under Nautilus, save title location, and adding a note under events. Those were the places that really needed the most help. And so by doing this usability test, instantly you know some areas you can just ignore because they're, they're fine. And then you know the other areas you need to focus on. Renata did another one. And so Renata um, did a test on photos and calendar. And so uh, she's the one who had the, uh, uh, when you create, a, uh, create, a, create an album, a lot of people had trouble doing it. I mean, they got there, right? One black, three reds, two orange, some yellow, one green, that was good. Uh, but people had real trouble creating an album for the first time in, in GNOME Photos. Uh, also, clearly adding a new calendar under calendar. And that was because creating a new calendar, you had to go into a menu. And you couldn't do it from the calendar itself. Uh, there's also something interesting going on with uh, under calendar, adding an online account. And because that one has, it's got some green, so that's good, but it's also got some red and orange in it. I probably would put some attention there. Um, there's maybe something that to look at under setting a photo as a background image and maybe deleting a photo. I wouldn't worry too much about deleting a photo, but I would say the top three to me seem to be that creating an album uh, under photos, adding a new calendar under calendar, and adding an online account under calendar. Those seem to be the ones that are the hottest rows. And then maybe setting the photo as a background image. And so you can see by looking at these results, you can instantly see the, the hot areas, the hot rows, that those are the tasks that take, that are really hard for your users. And so if you were coming into this test and saying, I wonder if people are going to be able to enhance a photo. I wonder how that, I wonder if I should be putting any work on that and make that easier to use. I would look at this and say, nope, that one's fine. Enhancing a photo, applying a filter, changing the photo colors, editing a photo in general, those are all easy. Don't even worry about those. Those are fine. Put your effort in the, on the rows that are hot. 
Now, carry, so everything, everybody up till now has been doing a traditional usability test, that formal usability test I described. Carry, uh, we, asked, we asked Carrie to do a test on a future, at the time future, um, design of the GNOME settings app. And so uh, Carrie did a, a paper prototype test. So that involved them uh, sitting with testers and with this printout and also a couple of printouts of some uh, other panels that you, when you clicked on, uh, that had a little bit more detail in them. And, and asking testers, here's a scenario task, where would you click? What, what setting on the left-hand side would you click on to be able to do this action? Now remember, I said before that you need uh, five testers um, and uh, to, to do a good usability test. That assumes that testers can uncover about 31% of, of, of usability issues. And that assumption works really, really well for traditional usability tests. You need a little bit more for a paper prototype test because you're not doing the same kind of thing. You're not exercising the program. You're just having them tell you where you point on stuff. Um, so you'll need a little bit more than five, not a bunch, uh, but you're getting up towards 10, and that's actually what we wound up doing our usability test on, was with 10 testers. So because it was a paper prototype test, uh, the colors are a little different up here. And so here's how uh, Carrie did, did their uh, colors. Uh, I'm going to give you a task. You tell me where, what, what, uh, what you'd click on, and if you got it right, I'm going to just mark that with green. And if you got it wrong, I'm going to mark it red and we're going to move on. No second attempt. Because the goal is to try and get people to click on the right thing the first try. Um, there were some panels that had a sub-panel in it. So mon monitor colors was one, uh, and projector, projector connection, because they're basically talking about displays, uh, that had a panel within a panel. And so that one was, uh, if the person clicked on the first thing, correct to get to the right starting panel, um, but they couldn't figure out where to go from there, it was listed as orange. And so that's why you're seeing uh, four orange cells up there. And so again, we've got descriptions uh, of the scenario tasks down the left-hand side, and, this, and, and Carrie did 23 scenario tasks, because it doesn't take very long, right? You want to you keep your usability tests to a about an hour or less. Otherwise, people tend not to pay attention as much. Uh, if you hit the 45 minute zone, that's that's like probably a good spot to be, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and when you're doing a paper prototype test, they're going through that a lot faster. So you can actually have more te more tests in a paper prototype test and not worry about going over time. Uh, so what are the hot rows on here? Certainly uh, changing your screen lock time that was pretty hard. Uh, that's privacy. But it just, I think people were, uh, were trying to click on display. And so with the new settings, I, I haven't looked, but I think this, uh, you can now get to uh, screen lock time from the display panel as well. You can get there from both locations. Uh, monitor colors has a lot of red and a couple of orange. And that one was a two-step. You had to go to details and then color. And that was a bit of a challenge. Some people couldn't even get to the details tab. So that's been changed around. I think that they've now put some of that stuff in display as well. I haven't gone back to look, but I'm pretty sure that's where they put it. At least that's where they were discussing at the time. And so then it's sort of a matter of looking at it and saying, are there any other rows that are kind of hot? And there are two other rows in there that are kind of hot. Uh, changing your default email client. Uh, there's no orange in that one. It's either green or it's red. So they, they, uh, they couldn't even get to, to the details tab. They, they picked the wrong one. Uh, but the, the correct path would be going to details and then uh, default application. And you had a lot of people out of the, out of the 10 testers, you had uh, seven of them that, that couldn't even figure out the details tab. And so that's one that's, I would call that a hot row. I'd also look at uh, number 16. Changing your time zone, which you do under uh, date and time. 
after that, you could probably look at some other areas that that uh, that that might need a little bit better, uh, like Bluetooth connection number five, uh, muting your notifications number seventeen. Those are probably some that could require some work. The rest of them I wouldn't worry about too much. Ethernet connection under 22, eh, I wouldn't worry about that one too much. Um, and, and certainly you wouldn't at all worry about your battery life. You know, how do people change the battery, uh, adjust the battery life? You know, you go into power. They're clearly getting that one. How do you change your alarm volume? Nine out of 10 people got it right that they went right to sound. Um, I don't even know that I worry too much about keyboard speed, right? Two people got that one wrong, but you know, most of them got it right. So you can, again, you're able to kind of figure out, uh, are your, uh, on your paper prototype, are you labeling things correctly under the left-hand side so that people are guided to the right, uh, to click on the right area the first time. And then, uh, it's been interesting to, uh, once we started uh, talking about the heat map, because it, it wound up being a, uh, I understand, a new thing. I, I thought it was something that was people were already using, but it turns out the, it was kind of a new thing. Uh, it's neat to see other people using this method. So um, the Debian project did a usability test on GNOME. And uh, their tests are uh, over there on, on Integrity's uh, website, but... Uh, this is what their test looked like. Now they, they did it a little bit differently. They had what they called missions, which is really groups of a couple of scenario tasks, but they're all highly related. It was basically the same thing. It was just, I recommend that every scenario task be like an atomic thing. Uh, this was a little bit longer than that, but it was, it's still a scenario task. Uh, so they tested uh, Nautilus, package management, and settings, not the new one, but the old one. And so where were the, the hot rows? Well, certainly you're seeing some hot rows under settings of trying to manage temporary files uh, and changing your default video player. Uh, also seeing a hot row on creating a bookmark under Nautilus, that one's still tough. Um, installing and moving packages under package management, that one's still tough. Uh, and I would say also adding and removing world clocks, still kind of tough. So those are the areas, those are the, the uh, what I just list out there, the five uh, tasks that wound up being tough for their testers. But again, those are, it tells you exactly where you need to go. It, it, with, these, with the scenario task, you now actually can figure out, uh, and in your notes, you can actually figure out where were people looking, what would make it, easier? Uh, why was it so hard? When you do these little brief interviews at the end of each tester, you can actually get that understanding of, well, I was trying to click on a button for, uh, I just thought there'd be a button for changing my uh, clock or something, right? I mean, something as easy as that. Uh, you can figure out from there to enough to make a tweak to your design that you can then uh, make a change to your design and then you do it again. Because if you're only testing with five testers, you can, you, it doesn't take very long to do a usability test. You can do a usability test in just a couple of hours. But again, no problems with searching for and installing a package. Uh, no problems with downloading and renaming files. No problems with manipulating folders under, under Nautilus. Uh, by the way, the um, package management um, was very interesting because um, in this version of software, uh, if you uh, want to install, let's say, GIMP, and somebody tells you that's a graphics program, so you go under, there's a graphics group, so you click under graphics, and you'll find GIMP on the list, and so you'll click on GIMP. Uh, and then in the little GIMP page, remember it's got the this title up there and it's got the little screenshot, and it's got a little you know, website down there. And before we uh, move the install button around, the install was way on the upper right-hand corner. Um, but it was a lot easier for people to, uh, to install if they did a search for it. If they, didn't, if they didn't just go under the categories and then click on the name of the program and then do the install, if they just went in the search box and typed GIMP, it was actually a lot easier to install, like 
when I did that test, like it was very easy for people to do that. Um, let me jump back to those notes. The um, Uh, where was the other one that we also did? Oh, I'm not seeing it now, but uh, it was when you when you do the inst when you do a search, um, it doesn't give you just one program. It gives you all the programs that match it. And it turns out on that search results, uh, in rows, you've got the the name of the program, a short description, and over here it says install. <laughs> And so it's much easier to install a program from the search results than it is to actually go and click on the name of the program. So that was very interesting. Since I have a couple of minutes, let me also talk about a user experience test. And I'll tell you right now, this one did not go well. So learn from our mistake. Uh, when we did this user experience test, this is with Diana uh, during her internship, uh, we had them try using GNOME for the first time. And uh, we gave them three scenarios, not scenario tasks, but scenarios saying, okay, this is the first time you're using GNOME and uh, we want you to do these vaguely described things that would get people to kind of exercise the system. We gave them about half an hour or so to do all three of these tasks. That's about how long it took. It was things like, Here's a fob drive. Let's pretend that this fob drive contains all the files from your previous laptop. And so we give them about 40 or 50 files on there that they need to restore. Uh, and it just, they can do it however they want. Uh, and then it was like, uh, you know, check your email. And then I can't remember what the third one was. Um, but the whole point was to have them just experience GNOME for the first time. And then we asked them two questions. After they're done with it. Think back to when you first started using GNOME half an hour ago. What was, what was your first reaction to GNOME? And now thinking about now, after having completed the test, what was your personal reaction to GNOME? And remember, user experience isn't the same as usability. User experience is more about your emotional connection or your emotional response to the software. And so it's a little bit fuzzier. And so the way that we tried to get around that fuzzy description was by having them use emoji, which actually other people have done has done too. And it, it, it just winds up, I think we picked too many emoji. I think that's why it didn't work. Um, uh, but we picked these 10 emoji that range from I hate it on the left-hand side to I'm very sad or it makes me sick, right? Very negative emotions, uh, kind of working your way up into the middle part where sort of the, yeah, you know, to getting more interesting to I finally on the right hand side, loving it, smiles, um, hearts. I think we picked too many, 10 is too many. If I were to do this again, I would drop this down to like six. I think there, it's possible to condense it down to six, maybe even five, uh, which might make it easier for people to kind of identify it. And also we would have them do a, uh, a description with like a word, like why don't you tell me a, uh, an adjective uh, that describes your experience, or pick from this list, this long page uh, of, of, of adjectives, uh, like pick five that, that describe your emotion as well as doing the, the emoji. But this is what we asked them to do, and so it was very interesting to see what we got in the results. So the results on this one are basically this. Uh, at the beginning of the test, uh, their emotional response was, high, we highlighted that in, in purple. And then at the end of the test, we highlighted it in blue. And now again, back to when we did the, when we talked about how many testers do you need, and I said five, that was if you're uncovering about, a tester can uncover about 31% of usability problems. A user experience test is not uncovering that. This is, this is a different test. So we needed more than five. Clearly we needed more than five. I would say we needed maybe 10 to 15 people to make this work. Uh, to make this work. But you can still see a little bit of uh, here. You, you know, you're seeing, a general motion from the left to the right. Uh, the first, the third, and the fourth users have a, they started a little bit in the sort of, either it's sort of meh or it's sort of uh, interesting, but sort of still in the middle uh, to being a very happy, or at least being in the happy zone on the, on the right-hand side. Of course, we also had two that went the other way, and that wasn't great. Um, 
to have somebody say at the beginning, ooh, this is interesting, to eh, at the end. Now, what does that mean? Well, I don't think we did enough of an interview either. I think this, when you're trying to do a user experience test, you're really trying to extract how people reacted to it, how they connected to it. Uh, and that's, that's an emotional thing you're trying to uncover. So uh, a user experience test, I think would have required, I think to do this again, and if any of you were to do it, I would talk to me and I'll help you design it based on what we've learned. But um, I think we would have needed more testers. We would have needed uh, uh, different questions and we would need to use fewer of these emoji uh, because I think 10 was too many. Uh, but that's it for uh, user experience and, and how to do usability testing. Uh, I do a blog uh, up here on open source usability.blogspot.com, uh, and I post on there yeah, fairly regularly. There, you go back, you'll find quite a bit of uh, how to's on how to actually do usability testing, including uh, links to all of the uh, interns' research that we did during our outreachy uh, research. So. At this time, I'll pause and uh, do questions. So thank you very much.